All right, we're going to talk today about um, rite of passage. I, I saw a, a little message on, I don't know where it was, but it was just a little kid preaching, and it just really, it just affected me, and I thought, so as I listened to it, I started realizing, you know, it's where we live. Uh, because my good wife, my beautiful wife, has backed off this a little bit because she felt like she's being too harsh. But she used to tell all the youth, make good choices. Make good choices. What is the rite of passage? The rite of passage is always your choices. Your life consists entirely of the things you have chosen. Even if, it, even if bad things have happened to you, you still have a choice as to how you let it affect the rest of your life. Bill Gates says, you can't help being born poor, but you sure can help not dying poor. It's up to us to make the decisions in life. And it's like, and, 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 and I'm sorry that this really chaps my uh, Calvinistic friends, but you know what? You're wrong. You're absolutely wrong because even up to the death of Jesus, those people had a choice. Jesus did not know that anybody was going to follow him, and yet he went and died for us anyway. You understand? Okay. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 2 says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. Oh, I just hate to say this because on the heels of, of my prosperity upbringing, you know what? There are bad things that happen in life and sometimes you don't get out of them. You go through them. Because in those times is when character is developed. In those times, because it's like anybody can serve God and do the right thing when everything's happening the way you want it to. But who's going to knuckle down and bite their lip and do it anyway, even if it doesn't serve your ideas or your purpose? I'm going to obey Him even if it costs me something. Numbers chapter 13. So that... That they sent in the spies. God had said, go in and possess the land. And he didn't tell them to send in the spies, but they sent in the spies. They spied it out for 40 days. And, and they all came back. And everybody had a bad report except Caleb and Joshua. And the funny thing is, is that they, they came, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than us. What is your assessment of your life? And don't think for a second that God's not listening and don't think for a second that your assessment of your life doesn't dictate the path you take and the circumstances you arrive at. In Numbers 13, he goes on to say, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. They were, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. And I'm going to tell you the most exhausting thing. Have you ever tried to encourage somebody that refuses to be encouraged? It's like trying to pump up a tire with a big hole in it. It just exhausts you because you know what? The truth of the matter is nobody can encourage you but you. Until you decide to get out of your own mess, to get out of your own way, to get out of your head and begin to believe what God says about it, nothing's ever going to change. And you, it's like Joyce Meyer said, you can be powerful or you can be pitiful, but you can't be both. Don't you think Caleb and Joshua saw the giants? Don't you think Caleb and Joshua saw the wall cities? They saw everything everybody else saw, but the difference was is that they'd heard something greater than what they saw. And so finally God tells Moses, let us just wipe them out. I'll just, I'll just start over with you. And Moses, I don't know, just please forgive me. Not this group. But there's been groups I go, that's right, let's go ahead, God, kill them all. We'll start over. If I get a new building, we'll go somewhere else. That shocks you, I know. Moses should have been fed up with him. But he, he, he interceded and said, if you do that, then the Egyptians are going to hear it. It's going, they're they're going to uh, you know, talk bad about you. And he said, well, 
I'm going to pardon them at your word. Wow, that's pretty strong by itself. But the, the children of Israel kept complaining and moaning and, won't, and, and, and wishing they were back in Egypt. And I want to tell you, that I, I've, I've seen so many people come to this altar. And, and altars around the country. I mean, I've been everywhere and I've seen people come to an altar. And it's, and it's kind of like if you go back on a return uh, visit and you won't know, where's that boy that was here the last time? Well, he's back out in the world. It's because, you know what? It, it's just, I don't know what everybody's thinking this is, what salvation is. It's not some magic carpet ride. Yeah. It's a decision. It's a choice to leave one life behind and to walk into a brand new life. And it's still a choice every day of your life whether you're going to obey Him and walk in His, His promise or just, just slide back. And sl you can easily slide right back. And trust me, it doesn't take much. All it takes is keeping entertaining some thoughts that don't need to be in your head. Next thing you know, you're so far away we can't find you. But He finally said to them, how long shall I bear with the, this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, watch this, says the Lord, just as you have said in my hearing, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. Now I've got a, I've got a, a I'm calling us out on this. I'm calling everybody in this room out on this. What am I saying? What is going through my mind and coming out of my mouth? What words am I using to describe my country, my situation, the gas prices, the government? What am I letting to form and flow through me? Because God is saying, I think again, if you want to talk like that, and that's what you want to dwell on, then have at it. But if you'll start to deny those things and call things that be not as though they were, I can turn this whole thing around. It takes any, so the, Proverbs says that the lazy man says there's a lion in the street. That means any idiot can state the obvious. And we're in trouble. But if we talk about the trouble, that's all we're going to have. Let's start talking about the answer. Right. Joshua and Caleb were the only ones to make it into the promised land. They saw the same giants that everybody else saw. But they chose to believe what God had promised instead. This was their rite of passage. Your rite of passage is going to come when you decide to do what God says, to believe what God says about you and about your situation. When you start, to, when you enter into this thing and you choose that direction, you will pass from that rut into the next level. Because this was their rite of passage, their final exam, the test. At every level, there is a choice that propels you over the Jordan into the promised land. What is keeping you from entering into God's best? As you continue to circle the mountain, what are you complaining about instead of believing Him for? See, the problem with this test, Johnny, is that I never know when it is. See, if I knew it was going to be next Thursday, oh, I'd be all ready. I'd be all Holy Ghost by then. I'd have fasted and prayed and, you know, done all these cool things and had my TBN lapel pin and I'd be all ready to go. But it doesn't happen when I'm ready for it. It just happens. And you know why? That's why he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Why do we, why do we hammer you about reading the Bible and staying in God's presence? Because you got to keep that in abundance. It's not that it's the only thing in there, Lord, we can't have that. We're, we're completely surrounded with, with everything that defies the Word of God. We're completely surrounded with people who refuse to believe and obey, but you've got to stay there anyway. You've got to make yourself. And this is just it. This is the game. This is, there's, there's no easy thing here. It's about going, okay, you know what? Jesus walked up to the cross and gave himself for me. What do I owe him in return? You never know when these moments are going to occur. If I knew there was going to be a test, I would have studied every choice, every opportunity to do good, every opportunity to do what is right is a decision that leads in one of two directions. Which way are you choosing? When in life, when you're away from your Christian friends, do you give yourself permission to act like the world? Because it's in those moments where you're coming upon a rite of passage. 
in Genesis 25. I believe this is the world we're living in right now. I told them in worship practice, if this gets me in trouble, I'm really sorry, I'm not. But I'll say it. You know, they can determine the sex of a baby before it's born now. Have the big reveal party. They're just having trouble determining it after it's born. And somebody, I don't want, I want to know who's driving the bus. I want to know who's in charge here. I want to know how these things are getting just run, running into our life and in our country because somewhere, somebody's got to draw the line. Well, you know what? I can't do anything personally about the shooting in Nashville. But I can do something about the atmosphere in Hartzell. I can start a fire right here and deny that thing the power and the privilege and the authority to exist wherever I have been given the dominion over. And we can huddle up and talk about how bad it is and we can huddle up together and say, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have dominion. You have the power. We bind every demonic presence. We bind every, bonnet. We, we bind every demonic spirit and everything that has control over this. Open the eyes of those that are blind. Let them see the truth. Let them know the truth. Because then the truth will what? Make them free, right? Well, we find the story of Jacob and Esau. And Esau comes in from hunting and, he t and Jacob's making some stew. And he says, please feed me with that same red stew for I am weary. Weary. Everybody say weary. weary. When you get weary, you make bad choices. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something. Weariness is not being tired. Weariness is being bewildered and spiritually exhausted. And you make poor choices because it's in those moments you start feeling sorry for yourself. And then somebody owes you something and next thing you know, you're going to take advantage of that moment and do something you'll be regretting later. So therefore, his name was called Edom because he eat them up. That's not what it said. But I made that up. See if anybody's listening. That's right. But Jacob said to him, he's holding a bowl of porridge. And he says, I tell you what, I'll give you this bowl of stew, but you got to sell me your birthright. Everybody listen to me for five seconds. This is what's going on in America. Probably the rest of the world is even more so. Because there's always going to be an immediate need that is important to you. Something in your flesh that has to be satisfied whether it's drugs, food, sex, whatever it is, it's always going to be there raising its ugly head. And it's going to demand you cave and demand you do what is needed right now. Because who gives a crap about a birthright? Who cares, right? I'm hungry. I'm in physical need. I'm addicted. I have to have this. I have to have that. So I'm going to do whatever I want to do now and forget about what consequence comes later. And so he got his bowl of stew and he gave away his birthright. And in that moment, that birthright meant nothing to him. I'll tell you what that birthright means is the first, well, they were twins. And he came out of the womb first. Esau came out of the womb first. And so by, by beating Jacob to that punch, it gave him half of the inheritance. Half! If Jacob went on to have, uh, I mean, if, 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 uh, Isaac went on to have 50 kids. It still would have been half of it was Esau's. That was a very expensive bowl of porridge. But he didn't care. So many people right now, they, they live from pillar to post. I got to have it now. I got to have the standard of living that my parents had immediately so they get in great debt and they're a slave to it the rest of their lives. It's like me. I got to have that bag of peanut M&M's. Don't stop me. <laughs> Whatever it is, right? Then Jacob says, swear to me this day. And so he swore to him and he sold him his birthright. Sold him his birthright to Jacob. In Matthew chapter 22 and 32, this is Jesus speaking. And he's quoting from the Old Testament. He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And you know what it should have said? should have said the God of Esau. 
How important was that bowl of soup? What history just got changed by a bowl of soup? For the rest of eternity, he got knocked out of the lineage that brought us Jesus. Choices, choices, choices. Hebrews chapter 11. We're talking about Moses. Y'all still with me? So by faith, Moses, when he had become of age, refused. Everybody say refused. To be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing, rather, to suffer affliction. What kind of idiot chooses affliction over living in Pharaoh's palace? Because he suddenly realized what's important. Because the pleasures of sin only for a little while. But righteousness is forever. And he esteemed the reproach of Christ to be greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked for his reward. Don't think for a second there's not a reward for doing what's right. You just may not see it right away. Is anybody with me today? Hebrews 12 goes on to say this. So therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy that was set before him? It was Julian. It was Lynn. Not, and, and, and it was, it was the hope of you. Not the guarantee, just the hope that Eddie might hear this word and receive this forgiveness and be saved. So that was the joy that led him to lay there and let us beat him to death. Because he thought, if one of them will come, it'll be worth it. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus comes upon a guy called the rich young ruler. He had everything we worship. He had money, he had youth, and he had power. That's what we want in America. P90X is of the devil. (laughs) Are you kidding me? And he walks up to this guy and he gives an invitation to this guy that he has only given to 12 other guys. And it said that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Remember, everything he leads us into is because he loves us. He said to him, one thing you lack. See, the guy had come to him, he said, good master, what do I need to do to get into heaven? What must I do to have eternal life? So he said. And Jesus said, keep the commandments. Now that should have ended their conversation. But he said, which ones? And so Jesus filed through them and he said, well, I've already done all that. What am I missing? What am I missing? And Jesus loved him. He said, I'll tell you what, go your way and sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And what it should have said is that great possessions had him. The reason I bring this up is that, you know what? This was the 13th man. And I'm speculating here, but this could have been the job that the apostle Paul wound up with. He, He could have been grooming him to be the one to take Judas's place. And he turned it down because he had stuff. You don't have to have a lot of stuff and it doesn't have to be a Rolls Royce. But boy, I tell you right now, stuff can have you. Ain't that right? The more stuff I got, you know, we stored a bunch of stuff and then threw it away. How dumb is that? I stored a freezer and when I turned it on, it didn't work and I threw it away. Because I, why? Why do we have it? What is it for? 
Well, it's, not, it's only for one thing, and that is to, to take the distractions away from us in life so we can focus on what's important. Hebrews 4 says this. So therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you should seem to come short of it. Let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. For the, indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. In other words, you can hear about all this stuff every week, but until you start acting it out, it's not doing you any good. Put it into practice and it is really, it's just, you know, good doctrine and something to argue about. Jesus told them, he said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. And I see it happening every day and it's like it's almost unstoppable. The, the depravity that's happened in our country and the the complete moral breakdown. There is no, there is no code anymore. There's no, you know, I mean, I was taught things as a child by lost parents that were still good to things to do that they don't do it anymore. You know, and I'm going to say, I'm mean, right now, if you're going to interview from at my place, if you come in and say yeah and no, and don't say yes or no, sir, I'm not going to hire you. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. And, uh, because it shows honor, it shows respect. Well, we've gotten so far past that to where I, it's like the, the 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 whole sex thing in America has gotten completely out of hand. And it's like, I'm just wondering when the whole thing's gonna cave in. And so I look at that broad way because that's the way, I remember when I was in school, uh, I'm, at least I'm pointing at her because we were in the same grade. If you weren't a virgin, you got talked about. Now, if you are, you get talked about. You get bullied for that. And how that's turned in 40 years. It's because now we've just abandoned those stupid little things that got us to where, where we were, where we had, we had a, a, a moral fence that we lived inside of. Is anybody still with me? Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. I'm almost finished. Joshua 24 said, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know what? It's never too late for you fathers to put your foot down. Moms, it's never too late to put your foot down and say, you know what? I know how this has been before, but God has given me the authority over this home. And as of today, everything's going to change. And if you don't like it, then you can find somewhere else to live. But this is how it's going to be in my house. And you know what? Watch how things change almost overnight. Deuteronomy 30, 19, it's my last scripture. It says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. And then he leans in and goes, psst, choose life. I've set before you these choices. Choose life. Because if you'll choose life, then you and your descendants may live. I live for these little videos I get every day now. Yesterday, River looked at the, the big truck and turned back to Mama and went, Tay-Tay, for Taylor. That's right. And I'll show it to you as many times as you want to watch it. <laughs> because I want to tell you something. I didn't know, Johnny, that when I got saved, the choices that I'm making or affecting river. The choices that I make today are still affecting my grandkids and their kids and their kids up to a thousand generations. So it's important what we do and where we're going. And if nobody else is going and nobody else is going to do what's right, do it anyway! Because you will come out on top in Jesus' name.